Hi again. Welcome back. Um, this is part two of my talk, so um, I really appreciate it if uh, you decided to watch another half of my talk. So again, this is on homology and related invariants. And the first part was about SLN web and foam homologies giving a ribbon concordance obstruction. The second part is about spectral sequence bounds on other types of measures of distance. Um, I say other distances because there is some notion of distance within these classes. Um, so I'm gonna start with some topological notions of distance and there are, they're actually different. And then I'll talk about the motivation for this, like uh, construction by Ali Shahi and Ali Shahi Dowlin that gives a, a bound on a knotting number, which is like distance between a knot and becoming unknotted. And then I'll talk about how we can translate this to, there's a similar sort of idea coming from spectral sequences, namely the page in a spectral sequence where um, the spectral sequence collapses. Um, if you haven't seen spectral sequences, I'd be happy to talk to you about um, the ones that I work with at the office hours, which are on Wednesday at whatever time this is for you. Okay. So let me first start off with another reminder of Favonov homology. In the first part, I talked about it as a TQFT, but right now I just wanna focus on the fact that it is a bigraded module. So if I work with a coefficient ring R, um, Favonov homology actually has a homological and quantum grading. So each of these are going to be integers. And you can think of it as for each pair of integers in the lattice Z O plus Z or Z cross Z, um, there is some R module. So if I'm working over a field, it would be just some vector space of some dimension. So re recall from last time that Kavanaugh homology corresponds to this Frobenia system. Now I'm going to be talking about some perturbations of this. So instead of using the universal theory, um, first I want to think about this thing called Lie homology, which is just changing the quadratic by separating the two roots. So now we have a root that is zero. Oh, sorry. Now we have two roots that are plus and minus one. Um, this is very much related to another version, like one of the versions of the universal Kavanaugh homology, which is that you could think of this as R adjoint, just one indeterminate T and X, and then mod out by this quadratic X squared minus T, and then you set T equal to one. And the reason why I want to call both of these Lie homology is because when you talk about gradings, you tend to want to think about this. And if you talk about, sorry, if you want to talk about um, T torsion, which we'll get to later, you want to think about this. And when you want to talk about a filtration coming from a filtration grading, you think about this. So in my mind, they're really the same thing, um, just from a different point of view. Now, Lie homology was defined by Unsu Li very soon after Kovanov's paper came out. And then Rasmussen used Lee's paper to do a whole bunch of things. And so he noticed that there is a spectral sequence from Kovanov homology to Lee homology. And the interesting thing about Lee homology is that it's very simple. So if you have a link with some number of components, this is just going to be like two th things for a knot, uh, sorry, two to the number of link components, number of what we call towers in this case, or dimensions or rank in this case. So the point is that this is very simple. This is more complicated, but as you turn the pages of the spectral sequence, you kind of take homology each time and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And once the size is correct, you know you've hit Lie homology. So using this metric, we can get a number called the page of the Lie spectral sequence where this uh, collapses. In other words, it means that you're turning the pages and everything's changing and changing, getting shrink shrinking to become smaller and smaller until at some point it stabilizes. And the first page where you have your stable behavior is called PG sub Li. So similarly, you can define a different perturbation where the quadratic is actually um, x squared minus hx analogous to this. 
Um, it's called the Barnaton spectral sequence. So I'll be referring to both of these throughout, but with the examples, I'll just talk about the Lee spectral sequence. The, the reason why we need to talk about both of these is that um, if you think about Rhytomyster 2 invariance for Lee homology, um, it, you realize that you can't be over characteristic two because you need to divide by two at some point. But Barnaton's perturbation does work over characteristic two. So for the purposes of this paper, I think about doing all the fields of characteristic um, zero or odd P using Lee homology and then supplement that with Barnaton homology. And for, I believe for characteristic not two, these two are actually equivalent in, in some way. It's called twist equivalence. Okay, so we're not losing any anybody. So let's start with these distance measurements. The first thing I need to talk about is this notion of Gordian distance. And all of my other distance measurements are going to be based on this notion. Um, if you have two knots, K1 and K2, you can look at two different diagrams of them that um, are similar, except that at some crossings, there are changes. So you might go from a positive to a negative crossing or the other way around. And if you compare all of the different ways you can do this, the minimum number of crossing changes needed to transform a diagram of K1 to a diagram of K2 is the Gordian distance between them. The most famous Gordian distance is of course a knotting number. So you wanna take a diagram of your knot and see how many crossings you need to change the sign of. So turn the, uh, change the over to under or under to over to get it to a diagram of the unknot. Okay, so now we can define a thing called alternation number. So if you think about the set of all alternating knots, you can then ask, what is the minimum distance between a random knot K and this whole set of alternating knots? So now we just have a bigger set of knots to measure the distance to. We can also, use um, other sets of knots, right? So for example, in our Havana study, we're going to actually replace this notion of alternating knots with something bigger. And these are the Havana thin knots. So what we do know is that alternating knots are Havana thin. And so if we measure the distance between any knot and the set of Havana thin knots, that will give us a lower bound on the alternation number because this set is contained within this set or the set of Havana thin knots. Okay. And then there's another notion of distance between a knot and the set of alternating knots. And it's actually very different from um, alternation number. Like by the name, you might think this is actually like the go-to notion of how far you are from alternating. But Terayev genus was developed to study the Jones polynomial, and it's, it's actually very much related to Havana homology as well. But it measures alternation like completely differently. So here's a rundown of Terayev genus. We're going to call it G sub capital T for Terayev. Um, first, we need to start with what a Terayev surface is. Basically, if you take a diagram of a knot, here I have just a one crossing diagram of the unknot, you can take the all zero resolution and get some collection of circles up here, and then take the all ones resolution, get some collection of circles down here. So if you'll remember from the previous talk, I had this notion of Havana homology coming from um, resolving this, this is the zero resolution, and this is the one resolution. Okay, and then you'll notice that the only thing different between these circles and these circles as a manifold embedded into um, three space, but you can think of it as like the plane of the diagram, is that there's a difference at the crossings. Everywhere else, it's just like, um, that arc of my diagram cross I. So it's not interesting there. 
So what I'm going to do is put down a cobordism that connects the all zero resolution to the all ones resolution. And the only place where something interesting happens is that I'm going to put a saddle connection between um, the bottom and the top here. So if you think about it, a saddle is exactly a cobordism between these two pictures. Okay, and from here, I can already define Terai of genus, but just for, you know, um, making our minds a bit happier, let's actually make this a closed surface so that we can see what's going on. What I'm going to do is also add in disks that close off the circles at the top and the bottom. Okay, so I have a pair of pants and I've actually sewn on both the leg holes and also the waist hole. And if you think about it, this actually just becomes a sphere. This is going to be the Turayev surface for this diagram. So notice that the Turayev surface is something that's associated to a particular diagram. <clears throat> it has a particular, it has a genus. If you just think about, you know, this is a, a saddle and then how many caps and cuffs I have, you can, using Euler characteristic, figure out that the genus of the surface has this formula. Um, by the way, the set of circles up top is called SA because some people like to call the zero resolution A resolution and the one resolution a B resolution. So I count the number of circles on top and on bottom, think about the crossings, do my Euler characteristic and I get the genus. Now, because the diagram of a knot can change, um, the Turayev surface might have different genus. So what I'm going to actually define is that the Turayev genus is the minimum of the achievable Turayev genuses, gen genera of the Turayev surfaces of different diagrams for K. And what's really interesting is that we actually know that a knot is alternating if and only if its Turayev genus is zero. And this is actually not terribly hard to understand. If you think about it, um, an alternating knot is alternating because it has an alternating diagram. Well, it turns out that if you have an alternating diagram, you can prove, as Turayev did, that the genus of that Turayev surface is actually going to be zero. So this should hopefully convince you that this fact is true. Now I have a couple of remarks comparing Turayev genus with alternation number. We know of knots with alternation number one, but with arbitrarily high Turayev genus. But then there are also a lot of knots with Turayev genus one, and um, people have conjectured that there is there are families with this property, but arbitrarily high alternation numbers. So these really are different measurements of distance from alternating. Okay, so let's switch gears and just talk about the, the simplest Gordian distance first. Uh, this is going to be the, the papers that motivated what we're going to talk about in our results. So in Ali Shahi's paper, as well as Ali Shahi and Dallin's papers, um, there's this idea of using um, the algebra, the actions on uh, Kavana homology to give bounds on the unknotting number. Um, I apologize if you haven't heard a lot of this stuff. I know it's a lot to absorb at once, so I won't talk about what H torsion really looks like, but I'm happy to tell you about it and draw some pictures. But what you can really think about is that because we're using this algebra that has, um, oops, sorry, this should be an H, that has this variable H in it, it turns out that you can multiply your homology classes by H and by the structure of Lie homology or Barnaton homology in this case, there's a bunch of infinite H towers. So classes in homology that you can keep multiplying H to and it never cancels out. And then there's the other part of the homology that's H torsion. Um, it turns out that the Lie homology, the simple portion of my 
Kaban homology are these infinite towers. And what the spectral sequence does is, is it just like kills off all these torsion pieces. So knowing that there's H torsion, we can define the order of some homology class in Kaban homology to be the minimum number of times you need to multiply by H to cancel it out. Um, I guess to annihilate is the correct word. And then um, what Ali Shahi defines is this MathFrac U quantity. And that's going to be the maximum of over all of the homology classes, obviously just the torsion ones, not the non-torsion ones, uh, the maximum of their order. So you look at all the torsion classes, you see how long does it take until all of them die out, and I'm just left with the Barnaton or Lee homology at the end. And their theorem, and the theorem says that this math frac U is a lower bound for a nodding number. Uh, when I talk about the Lee homology example, I'll give you a proof idea. So just hold on to that for a bit. Um, Ali Shahi also proved that this is actually a sometimes a better bound than another sort of inherent bound coming from Kavana homology based on Rasmussen's S invariant. So there are knots where the a knotting number as a lower bound is a better lower bound than just the um, absolute value of Rasmussen's S invariant divided by two. Okay, so it's really getting at more information. Okay, so now let's talk about Lee homology. Remember that this is the towers version of Lee homology. It has this indeterminate T. Because we're modding out by this polynomial, X squared is just equal to T. So T torsion and X torsion are the same. T torsion is analogous to H torsion in Barnaton homology, but for their paper, they're going to work with X torsion. Uh, now we can define this math frac U sub X as the maximum over all the homology classes that are torsion of the X torsion order. Okay. And then if you really wanna think about how X torsion and T torsion are related, um, this would be the formula for it. Okay, so similarly to the previous um, work of Ali Shahi, we can say that the T torsion is going to give you a lower bound on a nodding number similar to here. And so we can say that, well, if we take the X torsion, we can also get an unnodding number bound. Um, yeah. So later on, when you look at the results coming from our paper, you'll see they sort of ceiling brackets and that sort of explains why. It's because for Lee homology, we want, we want to think about X torsion instead. So here's the idea of the proof. Um, instead of using the Frobenius algebra that I mentioned up here, expand it to have a variable X for each of the edges. And for the experts, you can think of this as a base point action uh, along each of the arcs. Ali Shahi and Dowland come up with a crossing change map. So each of these F and G is a chain map. And the interesting thing is that if you compose them, you don't get the identity, but you rather get an action of the base point at edge I. So plus or minus two times XI. Now using this, you can prove the following lemma which is that if two diagrams differ just at a single crossing, so you change the over to an under crossing, then the math frac UXs can only differ by at most one. So before we talk about the proof of this lemma, we can just think about how this would give a bound on a nodding number, right? So you have a diagram, you have a sequence of moves that change it into the unknot. So you just think about these chain maps at each of those local crossings. And if each, um, each time you make a move, this quantity can only change by one, well, then you're going to get a lower bound for the unnodding number. So it really comes down to proving this lemma. And the idea is that you can think about what F and G do on homology. So I'm going to be lazy and just use a single variable X here because <clears throat> it turns out that the 
action of each of the xi's is the same as just the action of x. Like on homology, they're going to be the same thing. Well, the order of a homology class is bounded below by the order of its image under f star. So it should be obvious that the image shouldn't have a higher order because of just algebra. And then you also apply G, but then you realize the difference between here and here is just that alpha became G of F of alpha and G of F of alpha in homology is just plus or minus two X times alpha. So this means that the X torsion is differing only by one. So um, this should really have an X. So sorry, the X order is only differing by at most one. And that proves one of the inequalities. And then if you want this absolute value bar, you just go ahead and use F star of G star. Okay, so now we've been talking about torsion order for Ali Shahi and Ali Shahi Dalman's papers. For us, we're going to think about spectral sequences. So instead of using the T here, we're just going to evaluate at one. So somehow T torsion here corresponds to spectral sequence killing off the torsion. The order of the T torsion, so how many Ts does it take to kill off alpha, corresponds to the page where alpha, a torsion element, dies. Um, the actual formula for it depends on how you index your spectral sequence and there are conventions for this. So the formulas will reflect that. For the experts, you can think about it this way. The quantum grading of T on this side is negative four. Um, on this side, we have some idea of how long the differentials on this pages of the spectral sequence are in terms of the quantum grading. And that's how we're going to do these similar bounds. Okay, so here are our results. I will give you two theorems, and then I'll give you an idea of how to prove theorem B. So you leave this talk having an idea of like roughly how we did this. Um, if you want a bound on alternation number, you can just use the page on which um, the Lee spectral sequence collapses. And there's this funky formula. If you wanna work over F2, then maybe, I mean, you can't use Lee homology, so you use Barnaton homology. It gives a similar bound. And the interesting thing about this is that, um, okay, so why worry about all of these fields? Sometimes you actually have um, not such as I think the torus knot, I want to say five, eight or something like that, where the Kamana homology between like F2 and F3 are very different. Like F3 is somehow special. And you can look in our paper for the actual charts. Um, so you might actually get better bounds for different coefficient rings. So this is a bound on alternation number coming from a bound on the um, distance between your knot and Kaban of thin knots. Theorem B is a bound on the other measure of how far you are from alternating, which is Terai of genus. And there's another nice formula. So here's an idea of the proof. The reason why we can actually relate these spectral sequence invariants to the Terai of genus is because of the work of Champernikar, Kaufman, and Stoltzfus. Um, which says that the width of Kavana homology is a lower bound for a Terai of genus. Um, the width of Kavana homology is a measure. So if you look at any chart of Kavana homology, this big lattice Z cross Z, it's usually like it's centered along this diagonal uh, when you think about homological and quantum grading. And it's sort of like, how many of these lattice points actually have non-zero uh, vector spaces in them? Well, that's sort of like the width, like how fat is the Kalmanic homology? Okay, so there's some sense of like how much quantum and homological gratings 
can differ between um, Kavanov homology classes that are non-zero. And roughly to prove this, you would just think about on what page um, of a Lie differential am I on before everything gets killed? Well, that differential, the last differential that actually does something has a by degree of something that we understand where this is the homological degree and this is the quantum degree. So that means that we can say something about if the last differential that was non-zero was on page N, then that means that the width of Kabbalah homology is at least two N minus two. I guess I should say like for any page N where the differential is non-zero that I know the width is still bigger. And that's how you get um, something that you plug into here, plug this on the left here, and you get a bound. Similarly, for the Barnaton spectral sequence, you also have pages to turn, and this has a different set of by degrees for your um, later arrows. And what this says precisely is that if your differential is non-zero on page n, then the width is greater than n. Okay, so this is very much related to um, Ali Shahi and Dallin's work. If you're interested in applications of these, you can check our paper. Um, there are, I think, like three examples of where this actually gives some new information. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thanks again for watching my talk, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about any questions at my office hours.